All right, good morning again. Welcome to your technical content for DrupalCon on Tuesday. Very happy to be kicking off your Tuesday for you. Today we're going to be talking about workflows for PHP libraries. I'm Greg Anderson. I'm an infrastructure engineer at Pantheon and an open source contributor. I've contributed to things like Drush and the RoboPHP task runner, composer utilities, and things of that nature. And today we're talking about the process of using <coughs> generic PHP libraries in the context of Drupal. You might have a Drupal 8 site, you might have another site that's still running on Drupal 7, and if you have some technology, especially if you want to interface with some outside system, it's natural for you to want to be able to factor out your common code into an independent library that you can reuse in both places, and then just make a Drupal 8 version of the library and a Drupal 7 version of the library, and you're good to go from there. Optionally, you might want to stick a command line tool in just for testing and automation, and that's another thing that is more easily accomplished if you have a separate library. This is an example of what a Composer JSON looks like. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. If you add a minimal Composer JSON to your library and put in a require statement, then this tells Composer that it should load in this library whenever it's using your module. Now the way the Drupal community has sort of evolved for using Composer with modules is once you have one module that uses Composer for dependencies, then you should manage your entire site with Composer. You should use something like the Drupal Composer Drupal Project template that has both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 templates. Follow the pattern there, and then Composer will pull in all of your modules, and it'll also pull in all of the dependencies of your module. Other solutions like Composer Manager are really deprecated at this point, and you should stick with a straight Composer implementation. So what is our workflow that we're trying to set up here? We're talking about the process where you build a PHP library, you test it with PHP unit, and then you drop it into a Drupal context, and maybe do some more functional tests with Behat, and you repeat until your module is done. In this session, we're really gonna focus on that first step of building the library and testing it and making sure that it's perfect. However, PHP unit isn't the only thing we need. We also need collaboration, reproducibility, analysis, and documentation. There's a whole ecosystem of things that you need to be concerned about if you're going to collaborate with other people on software, whether it's within your team or in a community. Some of you may be familiar with George Jetson. George Jetson had a really demanding boss. Sometimes George would come home at night and he'd say, oh my God, my boss is a slave driver. He made me push the button three times today. <laughs> so that's the workflow we're going for. We wanna go for the George Jetson workflow. When it's time for you to roll out your module, you just push the button and the right thing happens. Work hard once, don't do that stuff over and over again. Then you can com complain to your significant other when you come home, oh my gosh, I had to run CI three times today. <laughs> but all things take effort, you know? If you're going to win the benefits of having a George Jetson workflow, then you have to spend some time to set it up. There's a fairly well-known XKCD cartoon where the author says, hey, how often do you do this thing? And how long does that thing take you? And from that, he built a little matrix. He says, okay, you're allowed to spend this much time, no more, on making your tool better, otherwise it's a waste of time. And this is a funny cartoon because, you know, as engineers, sometimes we get so focused on improving our tools that we never get onto the real product. And that, of course, isn't good. But what this cartoon misses is that not all time is equivalent. If you get a phone call from a customer and they say, my God, the site's down, and you trace the bug down to a, a bug, 
in your library, if you're depending on manual processes and it takes you longer to respond to that incident, then that's a lot worse than if you had spent an entire day making it possible for you to respond to incidents quickly. So consider all of these other factors when you're deciding how much time to spend on this. Onboarding new engineers and just rep reproducibility and the increase of content makes automation really worth it. Fortunately, there's a whole bunch of services that come to the rescue and make it a lot easier for you to get this automation done. We have task runners like Travis that will do tests for you. Uh, Scrutinizer is a really cool tool that will do uh, code complexity analysis. Of course, if you're going to use Composer, you need a package manager, and Packagist is the standard one. <coughs> um, coveralls will give you reports of how much uh, mm -hmm. coverage you've got on your various PHP unit tests. Uh, Versioni mm -hmm. is a neat little tool that will tell you about your open source license usage and all of your components. And of course, there's also a number of tools that will help you publish documentation online easily. And uh, these are the different things that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, in these examples, I'm going to be using a few projects uh, as templates. One is Lcache Lcache. This is a caching module that was developed at Pantheon, um, but it's general purpose. It's not even <coughs> specific to, not just Pantheon independent, but it's not Drupal specific. It's an independent library, works on WordPress as well. Uh, consolidation is a collection of projects that uh, have utilities for Symphony console applications. And uh, finally, I just threw in an example website. It's an old Drupal 7 site. It has some automation. It's not running on Pantheon. So if you have something that you want to set up, then you should be like Wally and utilize code reuse and see what else is out there. Everybody's using GitHub, which allows you to collaborate through the browser without having to set up Git, and there's lots and lots of integrations. This is going to be the cornerstone technology that enables the things that we're going to be talking about. But I also want to go over how to get the most out of GitHub. This GitHub is going to be your front page for your project, you know, if you care about other people collaborating with it. And there's some neat features of GitHub that uh, in some cases are underutilized. GitHub's a good way to go because if you click on the pencil, then it brings up an editor and people can submit pull requests right in the web browser, which means you don't have to learn all of this command line Git stuff. And in some cases, that sort of collaboration is, is really useful and helpful. I'm just gonna skip this part. <clears throat> if you have a good README, badges up at the top will link you to your other integrations. It tells people what integrations you have set up and it'll give a good indication of um, you know, whether this project is still being maintained and how the code is, is looking. If you add a contributing document, just commit a file called contributing.md at the root of your GitHub repository and there'll be a link to this page anytime someone submits a new pull request or an issue queue. This is a great place to tell people what sort of standards you are, are using in your project. Uh, Drupal core as a whole isn't using PSR2 yet, but if you're outside of Drupal, the rest of the world pretty much is. So um, when I'm making independent libraries, I like to enforce PSR2 and advertise the fact that I do in my contributing document. Similarly, GitHub issue templates will fill in the, instead of getting a blank slate when you're starting a pull request or an issue, it'll give the user something to fill in, which improves the uh, quality of your feedback. Mm -hmm. Next, I'm gonna be talking about Packagist. If you're making an independent library, you're going to have to make it possible for Composer to recognize it. And uh, Packagist is a very convenient web-based system for describing where to get your projects. But the integration is a little bit tricky to set up the first time you do it. Uh, the good news is this is the hardest integration we're going to talk about today. 
I'm going to go over a little bit how you describe a, a project such that packages can understand it for you. Um, up at the top, you have to give your project a name. This is actually optional in Composer JSON if you're not publishing your project, but it's strongly recommended. And the other little trick that's really useful that um, many projects fail to do is in the extra section, if you create something called a branch alias, then you can say, in this case, we're saying that the dev master branch is equivalent to the 1.x dev branch. Now the reason this is important is if you have one component that's asking for the development version of your library and another component that says, I work with 1.x, if you don't have a branch alias, then Composer won't know that your dev master is compatible with 1x, and then you won't be able to use those two modules together. So put in your branch alias uh, faithfully, and uh, it'll be easier for people to pull in dev versions like off of a pull request. So starting off in packages is really easy. You just give the address <coughs> of your repository and hit check. But in addition to just putting it in Packagist, you're going to want Packagist to automatically pull in the new versions of your library every time you release a new one. So in order to do that, you have to do a little bit of extra integration. Packagist is going to warn you up at the top that says that auto-updating is not happening. If auto-updating isn't happening, then every time you release something, you have to go and click that green update button to bring the new versions in. But we're going to automate that. So you go over to your profile section, and up at the top, if you click on your API token, it's going to show you this OAuth token, which is just a long set of characters. You can copy that on your clipboard. And then back in GitHub, in the integration and services section, you add a service. You find Packagist, either just by scrolling or type in Packagist, and click on it. You then put your Packagist username in the user section. The token you got off of your profile page in the second field, and down at the bottom, it must say HTTPS Packagist.org. Then you add the service and come back to the webhook section, open your service, and up at the top, there's a little test service button. If you click on that and then go back to Packagist, you'll see that the warning about the auto update has disappeared. If it's, the warning is still there, walk through the steps again, double check your username, make sure you said HTTPS, packagist.org. You should be able to get it up and running with those steps. Some projects have plugins. Here's an example of Drush. Drush has plugins, and if you write a Drush plugin and you give it a type of Drupal Drush, then that advertises that this is something that you can use with Drush. If you wanted to have something on your readme that says, hey, here's a list of everything in Packagist with this type, you can compose a link and drop that in your readme. Really useful for your users. Earlier I showed an example of badges at the top of your readme, which are nice way signs for your users. There's a site called poser.pugx.org that will give you additional badges that you can drop in to your packages site. It'll tell you things like how many times your project has been downloaded, but the one on this page that I think is really useful is the license. I'll talk about license a little bit more later. I don't think that the download vanity badges are really that useful to include on a project page. They mostly let people know how much your project is being used in continuous integration, and that number isn't really meaningful for much, but you know, a lot of people like the vanity badges. Uh, Travis is just one of the many ways that you can run tests. Uh, the reason I really like Travis is it makes it a lot easier to test different versions of uh, PHP. This is also possible on other systems, but as we will see in a moment, uh, it's much easier to set up with Travis. 
If you set up a file called phpunit.xml.dist, then PHP is going to load your settings from this file. Uh, you can git ignore the php.xml file if you want. Your users could copy the phpunit.xml.dist into phpunit.xml if they need to customize it. But for a minimal customization of uh, running PHP unit on Travis, all you need to do is uh, specify your autoload file and where you want to keep your tests and what file name pattern you want to find them under. And then um, PHP unit will run all of those files. I also like to use a project called um, Squiz Labs PHP Code Sniffer. This helps check for conformance like PSR2. Um, and if you just compose or require that, then um, <coughs> it'll show up in your composer JSON and you can make it part of your tests. So here's the thing I was alluding to earlier. Uh, if you want to do multiple PHP version testing on some other CI system like Circle, then you have to propose prepared Docker images and things like that. It's kind of inconvenient. But in Travis, it's a very simple matter of just listing all of the different versions of PHP you want to test, and Travis will automatically cycle through those, run the tests again after installing the version of PHP in the image. It makes it a lot easier to get good coverage across different versions. And then down at the bottom, in the script section, after running PHP unit, we also run PHP CS, which is part of the Squizlib thing that I showed you earlier. If someone submits a contribution and it doesn't follow PSR2, then the tests will fail. And you know that right away. And so that helps <coughs> not just you as a maintainer, but it's also a good service for your contributors. They don't have to wait for the maintainer to come back with just some nitpicky style feedback. Happens right away. Finally, uh, Travis has this interesting feature where it runs a test as soon as a branch is created and then it also <laughs> runs a test as soon as your pull request is created. And that means the same code gets <coughs> tested twice because every pull request has a branch. So in the branches section, if you're Travis YAML, if you add this funny regular <coughs> expression down at the bottom and say, I only want to test the master branch and branches that look like version numbers uh, because in Travis, tags and branches alike are um, applied on this branches section, then um, your pull request will only be tested once and this will conserve valuable Travis resources. So strongly recommended. Uh, one thing to make your life really happy is if you add a cache directory, Travis is gonna keep this around and in particular, the composer cache directory will greatly speed up your builds if you add that. Uh, I recommend committing your composer lock file if you're doing <coughs> Travis testing. And the reason for this is it really helps with what's called min-max testing. So you can see in the matrix I have here, there is a list of different PHP versions. And in some of these, we also define an environment variable depths. And we either set it to highest or lowest or empty. And then when we're setting up our project to test, we're going to run composer install. And by default, if you don't have a depths variable set, it's just going to run composer install with prefer disk, which will quickly load whatever's in your composer lock file. But if you have an independent library, it's also interesting to know it, whether the code still works against your lowest described dependencies and also your highest described dependencies. The lowest test is really important to make sure that no one has allowed any code that doesn't work with the low, lower software to creep in. And the highest is really important to find out if any new releases from uh, the programs that your library uses have come out that break your code. So to do lowest, we just run composer update with a dash dash prefer lowest. Um, to do highest, uh, we just run a composer update instead of a composer install. In both of those cases, that ignores the composer lock and brings in fresh dependencies so you get better <laughs> test coverage. Um, many of you have probably heard the rule of thumb 
that if you're making an application, you commit composer lock. If you're making a library, you don't commit composer lock. Why is that a rule? The reason that's a rule is that if you don't commit composer lock, then you get highest testing every time. And if you're doing a library and you're only doing one test, then I agree, highest is the best to do. But um, if, you, if you do the whole highest lowest, you'll get even better testing. And in that case, you might as well commit your composer lock so that those middle tests that are just running off of your preferred uh, versions run really fast. And the other advantage of this is if you have some failure that falls into one of these categories, it's really obvious just by looking at which tests failed uh, what the cause of it is. And with just highest testing, then suddenly all of your tests have failed and you have to scratch your head and wonder exactly why that happened. It's usually because of highest anyway, but um, with this it's a lot more clear if just one of the tests is failing and all the others work, then you have the confidence to know this is a dependency change and I didn't just accidentally commit something bad. And look how good it gets. Uh, the focus of this screen is on the lower right, uh, consolidation annotated command. It's not a very big library, it's pretty darn small, but it's not teeny. And uh, it, if you're not using the techniques that I just described, just, just described, you're not going to get down to this sub one minute test time uh, that we're seeing here. So it really makes a big difference to do your, your caching and things in <coughs> only 40 seconds if we're not messing with the composer lock. If you want to make a FAR, <coughs> you can do the hard work and look at the PHP FAR APIs and start writing some code. But there's a cool project called uh, Kergy Box, and if you install that, all you have to do is run box build and it's going to make a FAR for you. If you take <coughs> an existing box JSON file which describes what your FAR should look like, all you really have to modify is this part here that is highlighted in the middle, and this is from the Robo project. Um, you know, by default, you say which directories contain all of my sources. Uh, you can add additional files that are outside of that location if you just want to cherry pick some things. And uh, then down at the bottom, the finder allows you to have a better control over what goes in and what goes out. So just a little bit of editing of this, and then all of your uh, contents will go into a FAR and it actually works right. I have found that it's very easy using the PHP API to accidentally build a FAR that seems to mostly work, but uh, some of the FAR API functions for retrieving files just don't return anything. And that's very frustrating, it takes a long time to debug. So if you use a tool, you don't have to debug that. Travis also has a deployment feature. In the deploy section of your Travis YAML, if you say provider releases um, and provide your OAuth token for GitHub, then you can automatically mm -hmm. take some contents of your build results, such as your FAR file, and it'll get pushed <coughs> up to GitHub. So on GitHub, every time you have a release, there's a little section where you can go to see all of your releases, and it has tarballs that GitHub makes for you. Um, anything else that you put in here will show up right next to those uh, releases. So if you're distributing a FAR that you want people to release, you don't need to build it manually yourself and upload it to GitHub every time. You can just automate it as part of your TR, a part of your CI, and uh, this will happen anytime you push a release, which is to say a version 10. <laughs> I like to use a feature of Composer called Composer Scripts. If you make a script section inside of your Composer JSON file, then you can add new commands that are available from the command line when you run them with Composer. So in the highlighted example, if you run Composer unit, then it's going to run your PHP unit tests. And in this particular example, I define uh, the environment variable shell interactive equals true, and uh, this prevents a symphony from 
running code in a way that is uh, destructive to the tests for this project. So it's harder to describe necessarily all of the requirements. In README, if we start getting into the habit of providing these standard rules like a composer test, much like other projects do with make files, uh, then that makes it easier for people to just clone, build, and run your project without having to think twice about what they need to do or dig through your README. On the test script, yes. uh, is at unit, would that block if it fails at CS or would they both run? I would have to test that. Uh, this is, I, I don't remember. Um, but to call it out, in, in the square brackets, if the items start with an at, it recursively runs. Um, <coughs> and those can also be shell commands when you have a list of things like that. Uh, I, I don't remember if the list is interrupted by errors. I think it is. Okay. Because it's going to return your status code. So. Um, Uh, so if you provide testing with Travis, it's a good idea to put a badge on your README. Um, if you go to your uh, image status, status images on the Travis website, you can get, um, in, uh, oh, in this example, I'm showing image URL. If you wanted to, to put a badge on a file that was just HTML, you could do that. You can also switch image URL to markdown to get the markdown if it's going into a readme.md. Um, but the image URL is, is sometimes kind of interesting for a little hack we do. <coughs> Excuse me. At Pantheon, we have some wiki pages and they just collect in a wiki table a whole bunch of lists of projects and then we paste the images of the status badges into the wiki page and anyone who's viewing the wiki page will then see the status of all of those projects. So we have just made a uh, dynamically updated status page just in a wiki, which is kind of fun. Coveralls is a neat little service that will show you what your code coverage is like on your project. Um, it's easy to set up uh, in your PHP unit XML file, you just need a logging section which tells PHP unit how to produce this coverage information. In the example shown on the screen there, the unhighlighted line produces the Clover XML that's used by coveralls. The one that's commented out above it will generate HTML pages with your coverage. So if you want to look at code coverage reports offline, you can just uncomment that, run your unit tests, and uh, take a look at them locally. But if you put it online, then other users who are evaluating your project can look at the coverage results and, and see how much code coverage you've got. If you want to run the test coverage code, you need xdebug install on a Mac. This is really easy now if you just install uh, PHP with xdebug. If you're not on a Mac, you might want to use a VM. And then you compose or require Satoshi PHP coveralls, which is a little third party utility that helps upload your Clover XML to coveralls. And then you just add in a after success with this Travis retry command. And um, if you run vendor bin coveralls, it'll just put the, the results of your Clover XML up on coveralls for you. Uh, the result of, oh, sorry, another step. In coveralls itself, you have to click on this little <coughs> plus, and then you can just move the little radio slider to the on position. And once you do that, then coveralls will start keeping records of your, your build results. And then you can get a little graph over time that shows how your coverage goes up and down as you add tests and add extra features and things of that nature. Once you have all of this stuff in coveralls, uh, it has a nice little web user interface where you can take a look at the changes in any given pull request. And you can also sort these by most to least covered. So it gives you a nice place to find it areas in, in your code. 
that um, need a little more attention on your coverage. And if you click on one of these files, then it'll give little shadings showing red for lines that aren't covered and green for lines that are. In this example, we have a file that doesn't have great coverage, but it's a really small file and the uncovered lines are just providing some very uh, trivial defaults. So, you know, we can feel sort of good about this, but 100% coverage is even better, and this tool gives us the ability to make that decision about where we're gonna spend our time. The coverall badge <laughs> is uh, on the status page that shows coverage over time. A little embed section will give you the markdown to add to your README page. Scrutinizer is a particularly favorite tool of mine. There's a lot of various tools that try to make this claim of doing static analysis on your files, um, but some of them produce fairly low value bits of advice, and I've found over the last year or so that um, Scrutinizer, if you really understand what it's looking at, gives you some pretty good advice. <laughs> it uh, analyzes for code complexity and duplication and um, gives you some feedback in terms of bugs and hot spots that will help you focus on, on where you might want to refactor. It's easy to set up Scrutinizer. You just give it the name of your GitHub repository and it's going to pull it in. It, unlike some of the other services, it doesn't give you a list, but um, it's still fairly easy to get started. Um, and the other neat thing is on their website, they have a little Chrome plugin. If you choose to, you can install this plugin and then you'll get scrutinizer reports right inside of your pull requests. So if you have someone submit something and scrutinizer comes back and says, oh, this is a bug, um, then you can say, oh, I, I'd like you to fix this. Um, you know, you're missing this interface. Uh, this is an example of an inspection report that I ran <coughs> right after I uh, fixed a given problem. Um, Scrutinizer was complaining that I had a class called Hook Manager that was rated as an F because uh, what it really focuses on is class size and uh, complexity. And I'd gotten the complexity down, but it was still kind of a large class. Uh, Scrutinizer will give you advice about refactoring and it says, you know, sometimes if you have a class that's too large, it's doing too many different things. And in this case, the hook manager was responsible both for managing the hooks and also for doing the dispatching. Um, so I factored out a, a base class for dispatching and implemented a separate dispatcher for every piece in the code that was doing dispatching and then left the rest in hook manager and after that, uh, <coughs> scrutinizer said, hey, now hook manager looks good to me. I'm going to move it from an A to an F, and all of these little classes that I made were also uh, nice. So um, it's a pretty useful thing. And the way I found that is if you go to your code hotspots, you can see on the left is a list of all of your worst rated <coughs> classes, and on the right is your worst rated what they call PHP operations, which is to say just a method. And you have a couple of different techniques you can use. If you reduce your cyclometric complexity, which is to say reduce the number of code paths through a method, um, then your PHP operations will get better. But of course doing that will make the classes longer and then eventually the class <coughs> gets into an area where you're going to want to try to figure out how to split it up. But if you've already done the uh, complexity part, then that also will sort of help you figure out how to split up the class. Um, there's another, yeah. Here it says how to fix complexity. So in this case, I've got a class and it says, oh, this is complex. You might want to split it up. It'll also draw these class diagrams that shows how different things relate to each other. And I've highlighted the section here. Um, and this is an unfixed bug in some of my code. And I can say, oh, hey, I have all of these methods that have to do with options. And the other methods don't really talk to these, in, there's, a, there's not a lot of crosstalk. So this is a place where I could create a subclass and factor that out of, of my com complex class. So um, 
sometimes any static analysis tool will give you advice that you don't like, so just ignore it. Uh, but I found that um, if you recognize what the tool is, is good at and um, use it for that purpose, then I've been pretty happy with what Scrutinizer does. You can get a badge for Scrutinizer right under your um, overall score. Um, just paste the mark down into your README as usual. I'm just going to zoom through v version I really quickly, but um, you know, some people have said that this is not the most important tool, but what are we doing here? We are creating open source software, and there's a lot of different licenses in the world, so I, th I think we should try to pay attention at least a little bit. Um, in our composer JSON, we really want to put in explicitly the license that we allow um, right in the composer JSON because this will allow other programs such as version I <coughs> to automatically analyze. Um, here's an example of a, a version I output that is showing uh, one bit of software that's out of date and in this case, in this project, it was a decision to um, you know, just not do that. But the other interesting thing on this graph is there's a little Apache 2 license embedded in there. And Apache 2 can be a red flag because if you use something that is licensed Apache 2, that's incompatible with the GPL, um, which makes for a dicey situation if you want to mix things up. Um, <coughs> this is just the dev component here. It's not used in the main software. But if we click through on this link, then we find out something that uh, version I doesn't tell us very easily, and that is that this component is actually dual licensed under Apache and uh, GPL. So if you're not using version I, you can run a command called composer licenses, and that will output in your terminal a list of all of the licenses of all of the software that you use. So even if you don't bother to set up version I, I strongly recommend that you occasionally run composer licenses on your PHP libraries to see how your compliance is doing. And we can see down here that Composer's a little smarter than uh, version I. It's telling us right in the output that this file is dual licensed Apache and GPL. <coughs> um, when I do set up version I, what I like to do is I like to take the license badge from Poser that I showed you earlier, and then I edit it. So <coughs> instead of linking to package us, I link it to the version I licenses table. So if someone comes to my project and they click on the badge, they don't have to download my project and run composer licenses. They can see the output right from my project page. So read the docs is a really cool service that allows you to write documentation in Markdown, just like GitHub. And uh, the result of that is a, um, output that looks like this. Your markdown text is on the right, and there's a nice table of contents on the left that people can navigate through. And if you do your documentation and markdown files, it's really easy to edit in GitHub and uh, easy to update as part of pull requests. So I recommend that. Um, so here's a neat little trick. There is a project called uh, Markdown Docs, and if you run it, it'll troll through all of your PHP files, and it'll build a nice API doc, API doc in a single Markdown file. And uh, you can just add that to read the docs. Now the problem with this is that um, it's not automated. There's no way that you can have this system automatically generate your documentation off of a pull request because read the docs is written in Python and this markdown docs is written in uh, PHP and it's hard to get those two things to play together. So you have to make separate APIs and remember to update your documentation. But this technique is really easy to get started but it's just unfortunately cumbersome that, that it's not automated. So what if you want to automate you can move on to a more complex tool, GitHub Pages, that allows you to serve static <laughs> HTML directly from GitHub out of a, a separate branch on Travis. I mean, on, on GitHub that you generate on Travis. 
on GitHub, you can launch the automatic page generator. And uh, it has a whole bunch of templates that you can just click on. And it's one time, it's going to splat down some HTML. And uh, it looks about like this, the template that I picked. And then with a little bit of CSS fiddling and cursing, I made it look like this. <laughs> but <coughs> mostly, you're not going to want to do CSS fiddling and cursing if you can avoid it. Um, I don't really have time in this presentation to talk about all of the options that are available, but uh, you can add a whole bunch of different techniques, like the uh, mkeydocs.org is the markdown to HTML generator that Read the Docs uses, and you can use that as part of your GitHub pages process, especially if you're moving from Read the Docs to a more complicated system. Uh, Jekyll is really popular, and uh, Sculpin is a PHP project that, that does similar things. And there's many more uh, that'll keep you out of this hand <coughs> CSS fiddling world. Uh, once you're doing GitHub pages, then it's possible to automate your API generation. And the API generator I like is called SAMI. And this is part of the Symphony project. And it makes a very Java doc-like mm -hmm. output from your, um, your PHP sources. Uh, this slide is just showing you how to run SAMI. I would recommend that you grab this from somewhere that's already doing it successfully, like one of the consolidation projects, and copy it with a little bit of um, customization. Then you can easily have your code run through SAMI. And um, well, I wasn't kind enough to give a <coughs> screenshot for that. Um, oh, okay, this is also showing that you need to um, set up some environment variables to put your GitHub token and your email address into the environment variable sections on Travis so that you have the rights to actually run SAMI and then push that back up to GitHub when it runs. And here is the, the diagram that I wanted to show you um, that shows you all of your classes on the left and you click on it and then it shows you all of the methods and those are all linked up. This was used to make the Symphony API doc so it's nice and clean and uh, despite the length of that script I showed you a couple of slides back, it's not really that hard to set up. It's automated um, if you have a module that has a little bit of a medium to large size API, I recommend taking the time to do that. So um, that is the extent of what I wanted to go over today. There's going to be some really cool contribution sprints coming up. Uh, I hope you will stay for those. The first time Sprinters Workshop is at uh, 9 a.m. in room 307. We've got a mentored course sprint also at 9 a.m. in rooms 301 through 303, the big sprint rooms. You may have already been there. And uh, the general sprints are going to move to rooms 309 and 310. So thank you very much for coming. Please find the presentation on the slides, uh, session section, and uh, I'll take any questions <coughs> anyone might have at this time. Uh, please come to the microphone if you have a question. Are the slides available somewhere? Um, I'll certainly tweet it out, and okay. are you going, they're, they're all gonna show up on the schedule on DrupalCon. Yeah, they should be linked to the schedule.